What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, shrinksandsneakers.com. So before I get into my discussion for today's topic, I want you guys to consider liking and subscribing to the channel as it helps me to continue making psychiatry great again. So that's my pitch and now I'm going to dive right into the topic and this is one that people have been requesting from me for a while so I'm finally ready to tackle it after all this time and that is what is the evidence for medication use in borderline personality disorder. So what we're talking about here is not medication use for comorbidities in borderline personality disorder. What is the evidence to support the use of medication itself for the treatment of borderline personality disorder? So this is a controversial topic, a little bit of a dirty topic in psychiatry, but I'm gonna do justice to this topic and I'm gonna give you the most up-to-date research and evidence regarding the medications that can be used for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Before I start talking about the psychopharmacology associated with borderline personality disorder, I want to first talk about and set the context for the treatment of borderline personality disorder as a whole. So prior to the 1960s, most psychiatrists would run for the hills if somebody had borderline personality disorder. And the reason behind that was it was largely believed in the psychiatric community that these patients were not treatable. There was nothing that you could do to help this person with borderline personality disorder. Along came a psychoanalyst by the name of Otto Kernberg. So Otto Kernberg is a psychoanalyst who came up with a treatment for borderline personality disorder. So you're thinking probably this is great. He comes up with this treatment. It was called transference-based psychotherapy. And the only problem was it was a failure. It was horrible. Patients who had borderline personality disorder didn't do well with this therapy. And they didn't do well with this therapy for a few reasons. One of the big ones was psychoanalysis in general, and specifically this transference-based psychotherapy that Kernberg was trying to do, was unstructured in nature. And one of the things we know about treatment of borderline personality disorder is it requires structure and order. Also, the therapist, in, classically in psychoanalysis in general, but also in this case, this particular therapy case, it would be largely unresponsive. The therapist wouldn't be very active in the therapy. So if you've ever seen psychoanalysis done versus seeing, say, CBT or DBT done, what you would see is a huge difference in the activity of the therapist during the process. So the unresponsive therapist, unstructured nature, and finally the last piece that made this therapy an utter failure was it was unspecified boundaries. So they didn't specify at the onset what the boundaries were in the therapeutic relationship, which is very important again, going back to that idea that people with borderline personality disorder need structure and order in their lives, and you have to set boundaries with those patients. Now, in the 1990s, we see a new revolution in the treatment of borderline personality disorder. And along comes a psychologist by the name of Marsha Linehan. And Marsha Linehan is very famous, and she invented this style of therapy called DBT, or Dialectic Behavioral Therapy, DBT. And this is really a form of CBT, but it has a slightly different focus. The focus is on more group-based psychotherapy, as well as individual-based psychotherapy. And the main focus is on building essential skills or core skills and being able to tolerate distress, thus reducing the risk of self-harm and self-injurious behavior. So the idea is we focus on core skills, we use group and individual psychotherapy, and we are thus able to tolerate distress much easier than the typical patient with borderline personality disorder. So this is how this is this was the second revolution or second wave of treatment for D, for borderline personality disorder. Now, the problem is this. You might be saying, that's great, Dr. Rossi. So they actually have an awesome treatment, right? Super good treatment, really works well. Good luck finding someone who does DBT in your local community. The resources for DBT are quite scarce. Even in the community I work in, I don't know a single therapist that performs DBT. So the challenge is finding a psychotherapist capable of doing DBT effectively. So not only do you have to say you can do it, but you actually have to be able to follow through and you actually have to be able to perform as a therapist and produce the results. And so it's very difficult 
to find those people. So what winds up happening is patients end up coming to a general psychiatrist like myself with all these problems, all this stress, all these things going on in their lives, and then they wind up on medications. And in many cases, they wind up on many medications. So along came another psychiatrist who, who wrote a book called Good Psychiatric Management of Borderline Personality Disorder. And the idea behind it was that we could do good psychiatric management for borderline patients without necessarily going through the really um, hardcore psychotherapy of DBT, and we could still get outcomes that are quite similar to those of DBT. So I'm going to draw a lot of my information here, both for the psychopharmacology and for the psychotherapy or, or setting so-called the frame um, and the therapeutic relationship from the work of good psychiatric management for borderline personality disorder. I also want to say to you guys that I'm going to describe the evidence base for the use of medication in borderline personality disorder. However, I want you to keep a bunch of stuff in your mind when you're thinking about this. Number one, it's important to note that medications are adjunctive treatment and that patients needed to evaluate their usefulness. What I mean is that you need to be sure that as a patient, you're getting value from this medication. You're not just taking it for the sake of taking it. So evaluate the usefulness. It's only an adjunct. It's not a cure. The old APA guidelines, all the way back from 2001, super old, super useful. Nah, not really very useful, right? And they used to state that SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors were the recommended treatment of choice. But guess what? It's not true. Not true at all. So SSRIs are not good. It does not bear. It does not play out in the literature. So the APA guidelines are outdated. We know that these medications are only adjuncts. And the long-term use of medication in borderline personality disorder is super common. It's so common that up to 19%, think about this for a second, 19% of patients are on four to five medications. So 19% of patients with borderline personality disorder are on four or five different medications. That's insane, but it happens. And then let's take it a step further and point out that one third of those patients are consistently taking an additional as needed medication. So I'm on four or five medications already, and I'm taking additional medication when, you know, my mood is off or I'm feeling down or whatever the case is to try to alleviate those symptoms. So this is really, really um, polypharmacy and really bad practice, honestly, if you're treating patients with borderline personality disorder. So I'm going to tell you what the real deal is when it comes to pharmacology. We're about to crack into that right now. Okay, so I'm ready to talk about the pharmacology finally. Now, I put tags in the video, so if you want to just hear about the pharmacology, here we are. So what does the literature tell us? And I want to start with big picture aspects from the literature, and then we'll dial it down to the smaller aspects, okay? So the big picture aspects from the literature tell us a couple things. For affective dysregulation, so for affect dysregulation, medications like haloperidol, aripiprazole, orlanzapine, lamotrigine, divalproix, and toperamate all have evidence to support their use. For impulsivity, we know impulsivity can be a symptom of borderline personality disorder. The medications that have some evidence to support their use are aripiprazole, toperamate, lamotrigine. So you can see that those three medications were also in the affective dysregulation category as well as the impulsivity category. For cognitive or perceptual symptoms, it's aripiprazole and orlanzapine that have evidence. Importantly, as I said before in the previous segment, no SSRI medications were found to be beneficial. And if anything, they actually impaired some of the domains of patients with borderline personality disorder. So SSRIs actually may be destabilizing for patients with borderline personality disorder, unless, of course, they have a true comorbid depressive disorder. Importantly as well here for the big picture for you guys is that no medication alleviates the core symptoms of borderline personality disorder. And you might be saying to yourself, Dr. Rossi, what are those core symptoms of borderline personality disorder that medication cannot touch? Medication will not help you for these core symptoms. They are avoidance of abandonment, 
chronic feelings of emptiness, identity disturbance, meaning I have an unstable sense of self. I'm not sure who I am as a person and dissociation. So avoidance of abandonment, chronic feelings of emptiness, identity disturbance and dissociation are not helped in any way by any medication that I'm going to talk about here. So please be aware of that. That's where your psychotherapy is going to help you. And findings indicate that there is a large effect size. So large effect size means probably around 0.8, right, which is pretty high. Large effect size for mood stabilizers for impulsivity, anger, and emotional dysregulation. So there's a large effect size for mood stabilizers for those symptoms, specifically lamotrigine and topiramate. So I guess the bottom line here is that the most bang for my buck or the most value if I'm going to prescribe a medication for borderline personality disorder, it's going to be a mood stabilizing medication. Specifically, the literature indicates lamotrigine, also called lamictal, and topiramate, also known as topamax. So here I'm going to briefly take you guys step by step or, or class by class through each medication and what the evidence is to support it. So I'm going to actually start with some old school medications, the tricyclic antidepressants. So I've already said that SSRIs are ineffective for the treatment of borderline personality disorder and that in fact they actually might be destabilizing for a borderline personality disorder patient. So the tricyclics, imipramine, it failed to show any positive results. So imipramine doesn't work. Norepinephrine and sertraline based drugs were found to be helpful in about a third of borderline personality disorder patients. And again, they didn't really separate out there whether or not this person had comorbid depressive disorders. So again, if somebody has a true depre major depressive disorder, let's say, then possibly these medications can be effective. So about a third of patients have found some benefit. The largest effect for these medications was, as you might have guessed, on people's dysphoric mood. So people who had low mood or dysphoria, would feel better with antidepressant medications, specifically in this case, tricyclics. Important to note, tricyclic antidepressants can be fatal in overdose. So if I have a borderline personality disorder patient that I'm worried has a history of self-injurious behavior or what we call parasuicidal behaviors like overdosing intentionally, I may want to reconsider prescribing this medication as it could kill you. So watch out for that in the case of prescribing these medications. Largely, tricyclics are not prescribed by anybody anymore, even though I do think they still have value. Not so much, though, in borderline personality disorder. I think I pretty much said enough about SSRIs. I said that there is some evidence to support a reduction in self-harm and suicidality for SSRIs, but they may and they may decrease anxiety, but like I said, largely as a class, they don't show much effect in helping patients with borderline personality disorder unless they have some type of depressive or anxiety disorder that's diagnosed in addition. The risk for affective destabilization with these medications is much higher, and it actually, like I said, could be destabilizing to use an SSRI or SNRI in patients with borderline personality disorder. So oh, my favorite topic, benzodiazepines, right? What do we, what can we say about benzodiazepines and borderline personality disorder? They are largely bad for patients with borderline personality disorder. I feel like I'm saying the same thing about all these medications, but the reality is patients with borderline personality disorder have a high risk of addiction. They're already more likely to abuse substances so giving them a substance that's potentially abusable is a bad idea all the way around. Now, 16% of borderline personality disorder patients respond to alprazolam. So that's not even a third of patients. 16% is pretty low. Uh, and 15%, but 15% of those 16% actually became worse with more liability and disinhibition on benzodiazepines. So what you kind of see with benzodiazepines is what we would call a paradoxical effect. Normally when we think about benzodiazepines, we think about them as a calming effect, relaxing the person, but actually what happens in borderline personality disorder is the patient becomes more disinhibited and labile, and it actually makes them worse. So avoid benzodiazepines if you can in patients with BPD.